So when you look at the idea of tempo and how the world has been organized and the grid structure, tempo and structure and the way rhythm has functioned to organize human experience, if you hear house music, techno, drum and bass, all these quantized rhythms, they're essentially relating back to this idea of the clockwork economy of early Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand. So the pun here is I removed the hand, made a series of posters, uh, the clock has no you know, way of res responding to anything except the graffiti tags. It was a sense of humor. It wasn't a major art project, but we did it as a web piece. And we actually uploaded high resolution versions of the H4 clock for anyone to remix. So uh, I will jump to this one. That was the actual packaging, the, hand, the clock with no hands. Uh, so these are all available as freeware online. And what I want to do is play you the sound of the clock in a little bit, just so you get an idea. And we're going to jump ahead for a second. Um, so rhythm structure, pattern recognition. Longitude, the H4 clock, holding most of the idea of how we look at the grid structure together. That's early globalization. So what happens when you look at material memory, when a record becomes something that's actually viewed as a realistic document? Uh, the records always you know, kind of displace the performance of something. If you hear my voice and I could just walk away and the voice keeps going, do you need me or you just hear the record? Um, Thomas Edison was one of my favorite, you know, kind of weird, twisted egomaniac. Um, he actually felt that records were, were voices of the dead, and he felt the phonograph was never really going to be popular. In fact, he felt, why would anyone learn to listen to recorded music? So uh, he felt that he started marketing the phonograph cylinder recording to business executives who wanted to hear their business notes of market meetings. Uh, it was an it was abysmal failure, by the way. Uh, and so, till finally assistant said, why don't you give people a sense of recording performances and music? And uh, he took that and ran with it. So um, his master's voice, that dog photo <coughs> and other things, are, Thomas Edison was beyond being an inventor, he was an amazing marketer. And he was able to cr and create the popularity of recorded music way past what anyone had even wildly expected. But at the same time that was going on, radio was also making this idea of recorded music more and more popular. So. The turn of the 20th century, 19th on up, people begin to view performances through the prism of recording. For most of us, we live in a world of recordings. We no longer even relate to going to go see a live event that much. You usually will hear the record of a band before you go see the band. Um, or for that matter, a movie or any other device that's essentially about recording. You relate to the recording more than you do to the live event. Iraq, for example, is the most televised war in human history. Um, but no one has any idea why it was being fought, for example. Um, where were those weapons of mass destruction? So, hold on one second, I'm going to skip ahead. So, with Rebirth of a Nation, um, we had a tour at various opera houses, and one of them was we got the Greek government to give me the Acropolis for an evening. And um, I put bass speakers and woofers throughout the ruins of the Herod Atticus Theater. And of course, <coughs> uh, this is hip hop, so you know, there we go. And about 5,000 plus people came to the Acropolis and we set up sound systems throughout the ruins. And, I re and the Greek government was like, why does he want to play a Ku Klux Klan film at the Acropolis? Um, so, you know, I was like, <laughs> it's a valid question. Uh, so I was like, you know, you guys are Greek. You have uh, comedy, tragedy. And, uh, and then it's like, okay, we get it. So uh, basically about 5,000 plus people came out on a very beautiful night in Athens. And the film is coming out, um, I'm working with the producers of The Simpsons, it'll be out uh, later this year, and it's a nice DVD package, remixed with, I don't know, Bush or something, who knows. But um, the pun and metaphor, again, I'm gonna use this word metaphor, hopefully more than pun, um, is that you have this idea of early Greek theater, and I walk out and I say, hi everybody, I think I'm the first DJ to play here in 3,000 years. You know, so it's, it's a collision of times. It's, you're looking at multiple time zones in the same place which is a whole sense of, again, a critique of this Deleuzean idea of difference and repetition. When time and space are actually fragmented and recorded, uh, you can have multiple times at the same time. So uh, another metaphor would be you take a, a horn riff from 1920, a bass kick drum from 1950, and a, and a horn riff from 1975, and you put it all together, and you got Wu-Tang Clan. You know? so, one of my favorite science fiction writers is a gentleman by the name of William Gibson, and he came up with this phrase uh, that basically says, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So what I'm looking at with this kind of collage projects, literally they're temporal collage, um, playing with the idea of director as DJ, but also playing with this notion of how people look at the creative act 
and the evolution of the creative act over the last several centuries. Um, sampling really collapses sense of linear progress. Um, so I'm going to play with that in a moment, but I want to just kind of walk you guys through a couple things. Um, my next film is coming up, and we're having it premiere at the Denver um, Opera House for the Denver Convention of the Democrats. Um, so uh, the other film that I just shot was in Antarctica, and I went down to Antarctica for about four weeks. And um, there's some, some of the artwork I'm dealing with, it's a sense of humor, a sort of March of the Penguins. Uh, and it's a fictional manifesto for a non-existent nation state. Uh, manifesto for a People's Republic of Antarctica. And there's stickers and stuff. That, in the next batch of CDs, those will be going out. But um, the idea was, I was hanging out. <laughs> uh, you know, I have definitely a sense of humor, by the way. It was freezing when I took the picture. I was like, take the picture. Uh, but if you fall in the water, and the scale is huge, by the way. You have to imagine these are, it's, it's very far away. Um, yeah, so four weeks down there, you start taking a lot of photos and filming. But if you fall in the water, you basically die within two minutes. So it's a, what they call hypothermic shock. Um, so uh, freezing cold and looking at this idea of ice. So Rebirth of a Nation is kind of looking at the idea of the director as DJ, but also how we have an irreverent and impermanent relationship to these kind of historical documents um, where people are looking for certainty in history. Uh, so Birth of a Nation was considered a true document, and it was something that was the first one to play at the White House, actually. So um, D.W. Griffiths really uh, created a whole narrative in America. It's the DNA of American film. So as my next film, I wanted to go down to Antarctica and shoot a film where there's no people at all and use the ice as the main character. Um, so the film's about the sound of ice. Um, and it's going to be premiering mainly in a lot of big opera houses. Um, the nearest one to here is going to be at the Spoleto Opera Festival in Italy, which is a, it's the oldest opera festival in Europe, and we're getting a beautiful palace of some duke or something. Um, and, you know, we'll just play. I have to convince them how to project ice. But, um, let's see. I'm going to skip ahead for a second. These are sort of Antarctic maps, blah, 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 blah. Uh, hold on one second. Ah. All right. Two seconds while this reloads. Just a second here. But, all right, so Antarctica is essentially a blank space on the map. Okay. And it's something that essentially is where people have always thought um, the world ends. And so if you look back at the early portrayals of Antarctica, it was always a kind of uh, here be monsters kind of situation where the end of the world was kind of like just you didn't even know what was there. Uh, so they didn't know how to document it. And it wasn't until about 100 plus years ago that they were even able to have painters go there because paint would freeze, you weren't able to document it, and if you drew by hand, uh, your, you know, the freezing sense of cold would make your hands numb. You couldn't photograph it because the cameras wouldn't work and the, the, this, all the chemicals that we normally would use for photography didn't work. So it's, it hasn't been as documented as much as one would think. And in general, at maximum like peak population, there's only about 2,000 people on the entire continent. So um, I was there for a little bit under four weeks and went to some of the major ice fields to, to just think about this idea of urban deprogramming. So um, what I want to do is play a quick uh, kind of clip from the film to give you an idea of what the project's about. And uh, yeah, here we go. One second.